Today, my Lightroom and On One Photo Raw editing workflow, plus I'll take a few questions. Well, hey everybody, it's Hudson. Welcome to this week's Approach in the Scene. I hope everybody out there uh, is safe and sound. I wanna thank everyone in the community for, for helping to make this channel such a success, uh, for liking, for sharing, subscribing. There's always a subscribe button down there in the bottom right. And, and I wanna remind everyone there's a, there's a clickable, sort of hot linked time coded on the bar. If you're watching YouTube on your computer, you can just scroll in, see which section of the video you wanna watch or rewatch. And I also put a linked time coded table of contents. If you look at the video description, just click the title or click show more, depending on your platform. You can just jump to the part of the video that you wanna watch. So enough of the preamble. Today I wanna to talk a little bit about some things that I've had a ton of questions on, which is, you know, why are you using both Lightroom and On One? How do you use them in conjunction with one another? And, and I thought I'd just sort of walk through my editing workflow that I do on, on the lion's share of my images. Sometimes I use On One as a complete standalone and work on an image start to finish. Sometimes I use Lightroom and Photoshop as a complete standalone, but almost all of the top images that, that are my favorite portfolio images or run through on one to do finish editing, photo raw, and get stored in my Lightroom catalog. And I'll talk about why that is. Some of it's just sort of my history with having hundreds of thousands of images in a catalog that works well for me. So we'll talk about that. I'm gonna take a few questions about tripods because I've done a couple of tripod videos. So I'm gonna, basically a lot of this is driven by the community. And you know, as I've always said, Approaching the Scene is a series of videos that's all about all things photographic and driven by what you in the community watching this series of videos wants to learn. So I've had a ton of questions about my workflow. I've had a ton of questions lately about tripods with the release of a couple of videos I have about new tripods from Leo Photo that I'm really enjoying using and Acrotech heads along with Manfrotto 500AH heads. So, you know, skip to the end in that time code, uh, that clickable bar at the bottom of the YouTube video or look in the table of contents or just watch through and you'll see that towards the end. All right, so let's jump in. I, I actually have uh, an image. I've been going through and looking at some images from my past, some older images from my, from my portfolio's archive that really are still special to me, and maybe I edited them completely differently without as much skill and knowledge as I have now and without all of the digital tools that I have at my disposal now. And I would hope that, you know, 10 or 15 years from now, I'm looking back at the images that I took today with a more skillful, wiser set of eyes and even more new cool digital tools. And I think it's one of the beautiful things, one of the beautiful things about shooting raw images is that we can always go back, you know, to the, to the moment that they were captured, what that sensor and that camera saw and use the latest tools at our disposal to kind of get every bit of quality out of them that we can. So I'm gonna jump back to an older panoramic of mine, panoramic capture in the Portland Japanese garden, which I actually have sold a ton of prints of over the years. It's hanging in a lot of offices uh, and, and in my own home and family members' homes and friends' homes. It, it was one of my early kind of classic images taken with my Nikon D200 and a uh, 12 to 24 ultra wide angle APS-C lens. So let's jump in, let's have a look at it. Okay, so th this is an old edit, an old image from 2008 of a really, really oft photographed tree here in modern times. But you know, in, in the past, this uh, back in 2008, I'd only seen a couple of images of this and I had to kind of go looking for it in the Japanese garden. And this was a really stellar year. You know, I, I, I remember in one of my earlier scouts trips to the gardens, uh, you know, it hadn't quite peaked with the fall color, no leaves had fallen yet. Um, and I, I kept going back. It was a beautiful, beautiful fall in Oregon in 2008. We didn't have a lot of rain, which is kind of rare through the month of October. You can see here, this is October 21st. And then a week later on October 28th, I had this, this marine layer with this light cloud that was diffusing the sun coming down through the tree and the leaves were starting to fall and it was just peak color. And it was literally the best day that I've ever, ever seen this tree. In the last 12 years, I haven't seen it quite as nice. And now there are scads and scads of photographers lined up to get under here. 
But this is early on as I was experimenting with panoramas and I really wanted to shoot it a little bit differently. I wanted to set up and, and capture it uh, not with you know the, the, the 12 millimeter setting on my APS-C camera. Now remember this is 2008, I was working with a Nikon D200 that was 12 megapixels and it, it was APS-C and I was shooting it with a 12 to 24 uh, ultra wide lens for APS-C at 20 millimeters, which gives me a little bit more normal view. I set it vertically, I captured this in four frames, I would overlap a lot more today. Uh, and obviously I wish it was a, a higher megapixel camera, but we'll go through, we'll see what we get out of this image reimagining it. You know, I know I over-processed, over-saturated, over-sharpened. It's, it's horrific when you look at this image, how I edited it, despite the fact that it's, it's hanging on a lot of walls. I've got some versions of this that print really beautifully. You can see this is a TIFF file. I think I may have hand blended these images back in an early version of Photoshop. So. I don't even think we had all that great uh, a panoramic processing, and I've got highlights that are blown out here. So let's go back, let's revisit it. Um, oh, really quickly, too, I want to tell you, you know, this tree is really, really, really small, uh, and you're actually up underneath it, and these branches are so close to your lens as you're doing this type of panorama. This is one of those situations where I talk about complex panoramas and the need to get your lens back so that it's rotating Un over the top of the the, 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 the no parallax point is over the top of your tripod's axis of rotation. So you need a nodal slider for an image like this in order to have these images register and blend properly, even with the latest and greatest raw processing software when you have such close objects along with distant objects. Uh, and I had tested this lens, I knew it performed relatively well with little diffraction at f16 and I shot you know foreground to background relatively sharp in this some of its luck because it's 12 years ago and I think some of it was you know me having had good luck with f16 with that lens these days I test my lenses more intensely than I did so so let's look at the four images that I captured that went into this uh, and and you know I'm going to talk a little bit about my my processing technique and my image storage technique, you know, a lot of people ask me, why are you working in Lightroom and on one? And, and the truth of it is, you know, some of it's just, just sort of the legacy of, if I'm here in my library and you look at my, my storage library here that I have on the Drobo connected to my PC, I have 200, and I'm gonna throw my, my glasses on here, 284,000 plus images from 1996 to 2020. Uh, all stored in a Drobo that are in my Lightroom catalog. And I've got them organized into collections and, uh, you know, it's, it's all organized in a way that I've been working with in Lightroom for some time. And I have that catalog on one of these little Samsung T5 SSD drives I recommend, which works both with my PC desktop. I plug it in, it's formatted, uh, it's format XFAT, so I can plug it into my PC fire up Lightroom, it sees and reads that catalog. I go on the road with my MacBook Pro, plug it into the Apple operating system, it reads that XFAT hard drive, bloop, Lightroom fires up and I have all the previews for all 284,000 image, images with me. If I built full res previews, I have those. If I have smart previews, I have the ability to work on those. Everything's sort of with me, as long as I have this little tiny package with me. So it's kind of a, just an ease of use and a history of using Lightroom from version one. However, I really like to do all my finish editing in Photo Raw. You know, there are times where I just use Lightroom in Photoshop. There's times where I just use Light Photo Raw on one Photo Raw start to finish. I think those of you who don't want to own both pieces of software, either one does most of the same things. If you want to organize in on one and do your raw processing and do your panoramic mergers, all that stuff, it, it does a fantastic job of that. I just have a legacy of using Lightroom and it'd be very difficult for me to jump out of this huge catalog that I have in the history of using it. So I work with both and I'll show you how I do that right here. So, you know, the first thing I do with a panorama in Lightroom is I color code it blue. I select all these images, you know, click the first one, shift click the last one, right click, and I say I want color label to be blue. Uh, I'm gonna stack them. I go in, say group into stack with a right click. Uh, and then once they're grouped, you know, I can pick which one's my cover image just by clicking its little number title if I want that to be sort of on the top of the stack. I don't know why I would. I probably am going to choose this one to remember what panorama this is. And then I want to, you know, just check 
These are, these are old, I think I've reset them. This is straight out of the camera, believe it or not. As shot white balance, no changes at all in tone or in color. Yep, this is straight out of the camera. It was a very beautiful, colorful day. I'm actually gonna tone the color back from what the camera actually saw that day. And one of the things I love in Lightroom is the ability to create a raw panorama. So I'm just gonna right click here and I want to say photo merge to panorama. And it won't take long with 12 megapixel files. Now, again, I wish I'd have more overlap, gone further left, gone further right. Lots of things I know now 12 years later. Uh, I shot it in four images and there's, a, there's gaps up in here. And I wanna go ahead and, and use, this is some power from Photoshop underneath Lightroom, the content aware fill engine. I just want to fill these white spaces based on the content underlying them. And it does a magnificent job, particularly up here, down in the moss. There's a little bit, it's a little hanky up here. If I wanted to keep that, I'd have to go in and do some significant work because it's just cloned this little branch a couple times. But I know I want to crop this away anyway. It's a little out of focus. The F16 wasn't quite good enough for a branch so close to me. Um, and, and I just, I don't, I find it distracting, this bunch of, of branches there anyway. So I'm not gonna worry about it. I have several selections, spherical, cylindrical. Cylindrical is more if you have vertical objects in your frame, like columns in a building that need to stay perfectly straight. I like spherical for most wide angle work that I do out in nature. I'm just gonna go ahead and click merge. Uh, and it's gonna generate that panorama and stack it right in with my base images and put it on top of Cinestung. You can see where it says creating panorama up here. Now, with my Z7 and its 46 megapixel sensor and doing huge panoramas multi-row, it takes a lot longer <laughs> than an old 12 megapixel four frame panorama. First thing I wanna do is crop it a bit. I'm gonna, I can hit the R key or just click right here and it opens up the cropping engine and develop. And I wanna do a freeform crop. I wanna make sure this isn't locked into some aspect ratio. Some people love to create the same aspect ratio for all their images. If you're gonna do that with panoramas, maybe you create a two by three and a, or a one by three and a one by two aspect ratio. Me, I just like to free form and, and crop it how it seems like the image dictates to me. I'm gonna come down a little bit. I don't need all that stuff up at the top. Seems a little distracting. The heart of the image to me is right here. Uh, and I'm, I'm not such a fan of this kind of knuckle of tree limb here. That seems just a bit distracting. I'm gonna just barely eliminate that. That seems good to me. Yeah, and I'll hit enter. Boom. So that's what I'm gonna start working with. And then I wanna go through, and I'm just gonna do my raw processing on this raw file here in Lightroom. I wanna do all the basic raw processing because I have the most latitude to work with it here. And you can see I've got highlight clipping and shadow clipping activated. I can just click those and it's gonna show me a blue mask on the image where shadows pop up and a red mask where I'm blowing out my highlights. I'm more worried about highlights than shadows. So I'm gonna just start off by pulling the white slider a little bit, keeping an eye on this histogram. I still wanna have data up in these highlights. I don't wanna, that's gonna lose contrast if I pull whites too far. So I'm gonna pull them a little bit, then I'm gonna pull hi highlights back a bit. And wow, look at that. You see it just got rid of that. Uh, you can actually see a little detail in the fog up there and in the branches. I, I'm no longer clipping those highlights. Those were recoverable. The highlights that we were clipping in the original edit are gone. Um, there's none of this over sharpening that was in there. You see all the detail in these leaves. I'm gonna do a much better job now revisiting this. Um, and then I'm gonna pull shadows up a bit. I wanna just look at the, the tree trunk. Looks great. I think I did all this with curves and adjustment layers in Photoshop back when I did this original panorama. That looks good to me. Um, I would probably pull saturation back a little bit, but I don't necessarily want to do that globally. I want to go in, I want to use my hue, saturation, and luminance sliders. I'm going to click that. I have all selected so that I can see all of those in here. And for those of you that work in Lightroom, the, the fact that I clicked on hue, saturation, and luminance closed basic, because if you right click on one of these title bars, I have solo mode activated. That means if I click on one, like basic, it closes the last panel I had open. It mean, means a lot less scrolling around. I really like solo mode. I'm only working in one of these at a time. So I wanna go ahead and grab my targeted adjustment tool for saturation and hover over something very orange and just pull that back a little bit. I'm watching the image, not the numbers on the slider, and I'm pulling it back to where it just looks a little more natural to me. That looks like I was 
backing off orange and red about six or seven. And then I want to go into hue, and I actually want to take a little bit of the yellow out of my greens. I want to move them a little towards turquoise from yellow. So I'm just going to push those just a little bit. And all I do is hover over the color in the image that I want to adjust and, and, slide, and click and slide my mouse up or down in order to change those settings. It just is going to work on the, the part of the image that your targeted adjustment tool is over. When you're done, just click it again and you're back to having a normal mouse. And the last thing I want to do before I finish edit this and on one is go into the detail panel and just do a little sharpening. Uh, now I don't want to over sharpen it. I want to zoom into 100% here and I want to grab the Option key for Mac, the Alt key for PC, and, and that's going to give me a black and white mask. And I just want to drag that slider to where things sharpen up a bit for me, but don't seem over sharp. You know, if I pull it all the way to the right, it starts to get crunchy. Like, a, not as bad as I had it before, but it's crunchy. I'm going to pull it back some, and I'm just watching the image. To me, you know, the more you do this, the more you'll start to sort of have an eye for this, but somewhere right in here. And I generally find it somewhere between 40 and, and 75 for most digital images. Different cameras are different, different situations are different, different scenes, like all this detail is a little different. And then I want to keep that option or alt key held down and, and I get this beautiful mask when I do that. And I can move my radius slider. That says how big an edge is being affected in the sharpening. And for a really detailed image like this, I really want to be careful not to make it too big. You know, usually I'm somewhere between 0.5 and 1 on a really highly detailed image like this. I'm just watching the image. Uh, details, the same sort of thing. It, it goes in and does sort of sharp, smart sharpening, or smart sharpening on little tiny details when you pull it up. But it also makes the image a little too crunchy for my taste. You know, for, for an image like a, you know, a scene with very little detail, you might pull that up to really get all the edges. With a scene with so much detail, I like to err to keeping it off to the left and not overdoing that sharpening. Something, you know, down in this realm. I don't want to be creating halos and edge artifacts. And then finally, I want to grab my masking slider, and I want to just watch the image as I pull that. And areas that are black are not getting sharpened, and white are the edges that are getting sharpened. And I'm just going to pull it along till you know, the softer sorts of sections of the image aren't getting any sharpening. This is particularly useful if you have noise in your image. You'll see where the noise is, and you can eliminate it from the sharpening process. Smaller details can get eliminated by pulling this masking slider to the right. And then, you know, now that I've done this sharpening, I want to kind of turn it off and turn it on. Wow. It makes a really big difference zoomed into 100%. Now, here's something to think about. When I zoom back out, and I'm looking at it full screen, I turn it off and on. There's no human way to see the difference. And this is something I think a lot of people don't understand. If you're sharing this image on Instagram or Facebook or sending it out in an email attachment, no one's ever going to notice whether you sharpen it or not. And no one's going to notice if it's over sharpened. No one's going to notice if it's under sharpened. It's only for printing or for displaying on a huge monitor that people are going to walk close up to. That's when sharpening matters. So I don't even mess with any of this stuff if it's an image I don't think I'm going to print. If it's an image like this that I know I want to print later, I want to do it right now at the raw processing stage on the raw file so I have the most latitude to do it with the greatest of care. This is what kind of what's called input sharpening. It's just getting it looking as good as you can to your eye at 100% before you process it. There's going to be a little sharpening that goes on that's dependent on what type of print media you're using and what size the image is. That's later down the road. That's all been pretty automated. Uh, this part's the part that's a little bit of an art form, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. So that's my stage for processing in Lightroom. That would be done in Lightroom. Now I want to take it into OM1. And I'm going to right click the image. I'm going to say edit in. And I'm going to go into on one effects 2020. I can't process a Lightroom edited raw file in on one's raw engine. So it needs to create a copy. And I want it to create a copy of this raw panorama with the Lightroom adjustments intact. I want it to be a Photoshop document. That gives me the ability to work with layers. Uh, and I want to use Profoto RGB as a color space. That's a a color space that's really, really broad for editing images in. That's not the, the color space you want to use for, for putting it out on social media or sharing it. You want sRGB, uh, this, this setting right here. But for creating an editing master file, yes, you want Profoto RGB as wide a space as you can work in. And I want 16 bits uh, 
resolution doesn't matter that much. I'm going to stick with 300. And I'll go ahead, I'll click Edit, and that's going to create that Photoshop document, stack it into my stack with the original files, and open it in Photo Raw. Boom, click Photo Raw, there it is, ready to edit. And I'm in effects, that's where I told it to send it. Now I could use a preset if I wanted to in Photo Raw, but instead I'm, I'm just gonna go in here and I'm gonna do it from scratch. I, I know what I wanna do in here. I'm gonna click Add Filter, and this is this amazing raw layered workflow. Uh, I'm gonna, it's just, it's, it's gonna do all these adjustments and I have the ability to mask each adjustment and do blending layers on each adjustment layer here. But at this point, it's just doing metadata editing and it'll bake those into a layer saved on top of this Photoshop document as, as one of its layers and send it back to Lightroom when I'm done. So the first thing I wanna do in here, with an image with so much contrast, I sometimes like to play around with the HDR look filter and the initial look is gonna be way too much for me personally. It, it adds by default detail, which is sort of sharpening, and I wanna set that to zero, I wanna undo that. And then it has this slider, the only thing I'm doing right now is this slider, this compression slider. And what that does is it, it tones down the highlights and boosts the shadows in a way that looks kinda of HDR-ish, right? But if you pull it, I don't like that garish HDR look, I have never been a fan of it. Um, so I, I like to pull that compression slider down and just add a smidge of that, just a touch to my image. And again, I can go in and create a mask and mask it out of parts of the image and into parts of the image as I do this and watch what's happening with the mask and use edgeware tools like the perfect masking brush, all this cool stuff that On1 offers me. I don't need to do that here. I want to globally do it. Um, but I can also tone the opacity, the whole effect down and up. So you know, if I turn it off and turn it on, it's really subtle. It's just in the shadows, mainly watch down here around the base of the tree. It's just boosting those shadows a tiny bit more. I might pop it up just a little. So that's just a little, little touch that I got there. Then I wanna add dynamic contrast, and this is a filter that I really love to use. It adds pop, it adds punch, a little sharpening, a little micro contrast to different size details in your image. And, and, and you know, at its base setting, it's a little bit much for me. I'm actually gonna, once again, just to sort of show you what's going on here, I'm gonna set all these to zero. And now it's doing nothing to my image. If I want to kind of make the, the, the big edges, say the edge of the tree and the branches in this image, really stand out and pop, I could pull up dynamic contrast just on those big edges, and you can see that happening right there. It's dramatic. If I want the more finer details, but still kind of medium-sized details, it's gonna work on smaller details in the image, but still pretty good size. And then the little fine image parts of the image, like the leaves, now that's really affecting those more than anything else. I have my own sort of style save that I frequently like to use with dynamic contrast. It's a settings that I often find in the landscape really work well for me. Anytime you, you set sliders and you find yourself setting them the same way all the time, you can go in and save them as a style. So my Hudson Henry dynamic contrast style is 4-12-15. Uh, and, and right now, I wanna, I'm, I'm in a masking view right here. I'm gonna go back to my view tool. We've got masking tools and edge refining tools and all kinds of fun tools up here, but, but I just want the, to be able to zoom into 100%. And as I look at this, I'm making sure it isn't creating over sharpening. I turn this off, I turn it on. I wanna look at what it's doing in the image to me. And it's really just kind of creating pop, creating punch, creating a sharpness. I don't see any halos or edge effects being created. It looks like it's improving the image to me. You'll see that I've got a 4, 12, 15 setting here and I've also reduced opacity. You can always kind of blend it in a little just by reducing the overall opacity of this one filter in the stack. So now we have an HDR look with dynamic contrast to top it. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do, I only have a couple more things I wanna do to this, is a color adjustment filter. Uh, and, and what I can do in here, you'll see that there's all these little settings. Actually, I wanted a color enhancing filter. I'm gonna close this, I meant to grab a color enhancing. It gives you a little more power. I want a color enhancer, there it is. And it just has more of the overall color settings involved in it. And I wanna, you can go through and look at the different styles that On1 gives you here. Uh, fall and desert are often wonderful, but in a scene with as much orange and red, it's really quite garish here. I actually kind of like 
what foliage is doing to the green. It's just doing it too much. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and click that and then I'm gonna adjust that style. And you can see what it's done. These are the different color channels. Green is just ratcheted up too much for my taste. So I'm just gonna back it back down, uh, right? So it's just barely boosting its saturation or even, yeah, right? Just maybe right, you know, as I turn it up and turn it back down, I want something like that. And then I like what it's doing to the rest of the image. I can go in and tweak any of these color channels, but overall I just want to pull the saturation of the image back a little bit. I just want to tone it down. You know, the longer I do this photography gig, the more I find myself pulling that saturation slider to the left instead of the right. And I might do just a little bit more yet with the green right in there. I'm really looking at this interface in here. That looks great to me. So the last thing I want to do is focus the eye on this beautiful structure of the tree. It's almost like a neural structure. And I'm gonna use a vignette to do that. And I want my big softy vignette setting. That's a real sort of soft edged, um, hard vignette. And I, I wanna turn the feather of the setting way down so I can see what it's doing. And I wanna make it a little bit rounder and I wanna make it smaller. See how I'm adjusting these. I can grab it and move it around if I want. In this case, it's pretty centered up. Uh, and I might make it a little less round now and a little bit smaller, right like that. I'm gonna turn that feather back up and now, now all that's going wrong is it's way too dark. I'm just gonna make the outer edge brightness just a little bit less than the tree. I don't want you to notice that there's a vignette there. I just want your eye to be pulled more to the heart of the image. And when I turn it off and turn it on, it's super subtle but it looks great to me. So now if I, I take a look at what we had in Lightroom, it's great. Look what we got in OM1, it pops. It just gives it that extra bit of punch. And I, again, I used to do this with layer after adjustment layer in Photoshop and all these little tricks that were more complicated. This is quick and easy and I can even save a preset of this and apply it to another image and then just go through and tweak the settings. That's as simple as going up here to settings and. Uh, save settings as a preset or copy settings to apply to another image. You can create masks and copy them from one layer to another. It's just really simple and cool and powerful. So the minute I go ahead and click done here, it's going to save all those settings and it's going to pop it back into Lightroom once all of it's saved. It's going to save it on a layer so that if you opened it in Photoshop, you'd see the base layer of the image and all these adjustments laid out. Uh, on, on, the, on the, the layer that has them included. Photoshop's rendering a preview of that edited file. And we've just gone through and in that little process, I'm showing you, you know, how my workflow generally works between Lightroom and on one. I now have a stacked layer where there's four images that were my base panoramic capture images. Then a Lightroom edited raw pano that's a blend of all those. And then uh, on one edited PSD file. And those are all stacked and layered in there in my Lightroom catalog. Easy peasy. So that's how I generally work with Lightroom and on one together. Uh, I, I've had a number of questions from people about that. And again, you know, I would say, whatever software is working for you, work with it. They all are doing such similar things at this point. What I think on one does that Lightroom doesn't do for me uh, and that Photoshop doesn't do as simply is that beauty of having a layered masked workflow where I can just go through and add these filters that really give me the look that I want quickly and easily and allow me to create presets to just even work more quickly. So. That's the reason that I'm using both. Plus, I just really enjoy finish editing in on one. All right, so I've had a lot of questions about tripods of late. And you know, I did these two videos. I've had some people asking me, you know, what is the difference between the leg dimensions between the old Gitzo you were using and the new Leo Photo tall tripod set of legs that's lighter? And they're basically virtually identical. I think the biggest difference in the weight savings is that the Leo Photo's top is really highly CNC'd and milled, and all the extraneous materials are taken out of it that could possibly be for weight savings while it still is strong. Uh, and I think the Gitzo is more of a cast top piece. Uh, I've had people ask me 
about durability. And I've got to say that you know the the Gitzo, the original Gitzo I had lasted and lasted and lasted, and I, I zero complaints with the latest one. There've been a few things where I feel like. It, it, it let me down with its leg locks. Now, if, if you have the big Gitzo, if you bought it, it's a fantastic tripod. If you take good care of it, it's gonna last you and last you. If those little rubber coatings come off of the barrel adjusters to lock the leg locks, email Gitzo's repair facility, their parts facility in whichever country you're residing in, and they'll replace those for free if you complain about them. Um, I just, this thing's enough lighter, enough cheaper, that it, it really does take the cake for me and I'm really enjoying using it and, and I love this, this leveling adapter. I've had a number of people that listen to my video about the ultra light setup I have with the Acrotech head and the three point, or the 2.9 pound set of legs where the whole thing's less than four pounds. Ask me, you know, I, I've got a 500 AH, could I put it on that little set of legs? And you could, absolutely. These legs are bomb proof, solid, stiff. You know, I, I think that if you're out in winds or, or you're using a really heavy system, I would definitely put a little weight in your stone bag just to increase its stability. I think a lighter tripod is more easily blown over in the wind or gets a little top heavy with a big system on it. Um, but you absolutely could put your 500 AH on here. I just, for me, the reason for building this is to have an ultralight setup, a sub four pound setup. And you know, the 500 AH doesn't necessarily fit that bill nearly as well as this ultralight one pound Acrotech head that does panning and tilting. Um, you know, if, if I'm gonna carry the extra pound for this, I'm probably gonna carry the extra pound and a half to have the height that I need. Um, I've had a number of people ask me about why I want a tripod that gets so much taller than I am. You know, right now this tripod, I don't even have the last leg extended. And the reason is, you know, it's not, it's, I'm not that tall, obviously. I've had people that are say, you know, I'm shorter than you, Do I, should I get a smaller version? It's not about that. It's about that situation where you're standing up on a rock on the coast and the waves are breaking around you and there's room to get one tripod leg down on the rock with you, but the other two need to go somewhere. And if you have that, that length, you can extend your legs all the way and get them down into the rocks below where the waves are and still be up at the position that you wanted for your image. It's about being able to stand up on a wall to shoot over the top of trees and throw one leg down to the pavement below. It's about being on a steep hillside and being able to throw one leg out and still catch down there below you without having to get the tripod down to your waist because that one leg won't reach. Um, having a tall tripod is awesome, not to mention, it enables you to do things like shoot with the step ladder straight down from a higher vantage point. Sometimes that's incredibly handy. So there's all kinds of reasons. Um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of carrying a long set of legs and I will, I will guarantee people that have moved over to the fluid head, <laughs> as hard as it would be for you to go back to a ball head, it would be just as hard after you've used a long set of tripod legs for a while, you miss them anytime you don't have them. And that's an absolute fact for me as well as a number of other workshop participants and people I know that have converted over. The minute you don't have it, you're just like, I wish I had my long legs. All right, so that answers a few questions that I've had both about tripods and about my workflow. I hope that everybody is finding ways despite this crazy year and not being able to travel as much as all of us might, might like uh, to get out and practice, to hone those skills, to hone those photographic skills because you know it's like my friend Rick and I were talking recently. I mean, it, it really is all about the practice. It's about shooting, bringing those images in, looking at them critically in whatever editing software you like to work in, and then relating those edits back to what you did in the field, and then going back into the field and thinking about it differently based on what you saw on the computer when you got home. It's this back and forth. The one informs the other. You become a better editor, that makes you a better shooter. You become a better shooter, makes you a better editor. And it's this back and forth process where we slowly evolve, just like any other artistic practice it requires work. You don't get better resting on your laurels. So no matter the fact that we're all probably approaching life a little bit differently during this particular moment in history, make sure that you find time to get out and, and practice your art. Make sure that you're out there shooting and editing. So 
I hope everyone is staying safe. Again, you have questions, you have comments, you want to drive the content in this channel, email me, hit me up in the comments here on YouTube. That's what it's all about. This, this series of videos is really all about you. And again, I invite you uh, to join me in my free office hours. We're going to be doing office hours on Tuesday, uh, I believe it's the 18th of August, and we'll be talking about uh, times that it makes sense to break the rules, when breaking the rules go right. The fact that rules in photography are more guidelines than hard rules, and no one's going to arrest you for trying some things that break them. Sometimes the rule of thirds isn't right. So we're going to talk about that stuff in a collaborative Zoom meeting. You can go to hudsonhenry.com slash office hours to join up. You can also watch it on YouTube live. And I hope you'll, you'll join the conversation and also contribute questions when you sign up for that because that's, that's just really valuable. And I love going through and doing the Q&A. So hopefully we'll see you there. Thanks so much. And as far as approaching the theme goes, we'll see you next week.